Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and uh, we filmed a little bit of training footage today. It's mostly Brittany's training, uh, because she just felt like filming today. She wanted to give everyone an update so they can see where she's at. There were no PRs today. In fact, we had to reduce everything just slightly, uh, because she just recovered from strep throat. This is her second workout back, but she's like, you know what, I want to get on camera and get motivated to train. So uh, let me put on my plus five hat of weaponsmithing, and I'm going to kind of just voice this over, and I'm going to just flip the videos in, because I've noticed um, when I tried to do it the other way last time, YouTube did not like me having any sound in the gym footage. And this lets me just voice over all of it since I already know it's on it. They didn't like the background music. Um, so I'll just work around that this way. So yeah, one of the problems we did run into is you guys can watch here with her bench pressing. Normally I coach her on everything and that's something a lot of lifters, uh, serious lifters actually need form coaches and everything. Sometimes for their entire training careers. A lot of your top lifters actually never do a single rep in the gym. Uh, without somebody checking their form, counting their reps, helping them. There are people who are coached literally their whole powerlifting career. Um, and we are doing basic power training for her. But her bench press there, uh, seven reps. We're going to do sets of seven today. Uh, she had been doing sets of eight with this weight with 75 pounds. And what we do for her bench press, uh, we work with sets of five. When she gets strong enough to do three sets of six, we go to that and we go all the way up until she can comfortably do three sets of eight with a weight. Then we increase it five pounds and repeat the cycle three times a week. That's her bench training right now. And um, the problem we had there is that she had gotten to eight, but then she got sick. And so we're rebuilding back up. We had started with six. And then as you guys will watch on this next clip, unfortunately, she's used to me giving her cues. And on the last rep, I'm training her to pause until I say pause and then I say rack. Because I was back holding the camera, she couldn't hear me as well. With the background music playing, she ran into problems. She did her seven reps and she wasn't sure if she was supposed to rack it or not. The bar slipped out of her pad, came down to her stomach. Um, and again, that's one of the other things that's good for people to know. That's something that people need to be aware of. There's a reason you bench always with your face inside the J-hooks and you need to learn to set up that way and that's something you see exactly there with her because if you ever fail a bench or you don't have your spotter handy or even if you do have a spotter handy the the bar should never ever be able to contact your neck or your face if it is physically capable of doing so you are bench pressing incorrectly those J-hooks are there so that you can get set up and only move the weight a few inches over to over your chest press the lower chest back up and re-rack it the bar should never be able to hit your neck and again, that's just basic common sense on the bench press. And if people are teaching you to bench press any different than that, you need to run. They're going to get you hurt. They're idiots who do not know how to bench press. They don't know basic gym safety. Uh, again, a lot of people out there like that. But your neck should be completely enclosed between the J-hooks so that if the bar were to come down and roll, it stops on your chest. And it is physically impossible for it to get to your neck, even if you had 400 pounds on the bar. That's the idea. Again, that's just the intelligent way to bench. For she, that's her first time she's ever gotten pinned so it was a little bit of a surprise but she remembered my instructions on it since I wasn't over there to spot her so you know you roll it down and you sit up uh, it's called the roll of shame uh, and I had her stop benching after that you fail a rep on the bench press as a general rule you're done you don't train your chest you don't do any more pressing the rest of the day you are finished uh, I think that's a good rule for anyone to follow because your peripheral nervous system just got screwed by the failed rep you're done just like if you fail a rep on the deadlift you don't do any more exercises for your back or legs the rest of the day. You go home if that's all you have left. Uh, but for her, we kind of started there with the bench press other than just her light warm-up squats. So, yeah, good, important lesson to learn. And the other thing that people need to remember, uh, when you get used to working with people helping you or coaches, spotters, everything else, you have to remember that things are different when they're not there. And when you get into those habits... That's exactly what could happen. She got confused for a second because she didn't have me standing right over her telling her to press and then rack. And she's used to that. And that's okay. If someone were, were going to compete in powerlifting or something later, that's a good habit to have. But then if you're used to it, uh, it can be an issue. And with some of that is people need to remember, Brittany is still technically a novice lifter. Um, she is still in her novice phase. We've only been training continually for her for, I think, nine months or so because uh, she did take some downtime and everything she started a bit and she's worked with really terrible trainers in the past but she's still making noob gains at this point uh, her progression is still linear uh, mostly linear so we're working with it that way and treating her as a novice and she doesn't have that much training experience uh, but she's doing pretty good for it uh, then we did her deadlift uh, again typical things same way i have uh, i deadlift same way i teach people to deadlift you guys will notice she uses thoracic rounding uh, keeps a neutral neck and she does a pre, what I call, 
the term the term for it gets changed a lot. I think the best term I've ever heard used for it is like a pre-motor unit slap technique to where you grip the bar, then you pull down, and just as you tighten up the pull, you pull up. Similar to what I do. Uh, but yeah, she's doing like 175. For five there, or did she do? Yeah, 175. So we, we're not at a PR yet. I think uh, next time she's gonna go up on that a little bit. But uh, her deadlift looked good and everything today. We didn't want to push it too hard though, just because again, she's coming back and she had just failed the bench press. So we decided to not try to do anything heavier than she's previously done. She is now done uh, that same weight for five reps. This is her third time doing it, but we've had to take you know a few days of downtime and she had to recover from that. Uh, then she did her pin lay rows. Uh, which you guys will see the same thing when you have someone who's coaching you up close and watching you uh, that's the one thing you will notice is that it's good to either film yourself or to have someone coach every single set you do because again she's still learning the pen lay row we haven't been doing it that long i think we've only been doing the pen lay row for her for about five weeks now and one of the things you'll notice uh, her first set looks better but then as you get further into some of the sets she has a bad habit of allow allowing slack to get in there and when she's at the bottom, her elbows aren't fully extended. And again, it just has to do with learning the technique on the pin lay row. The pin lay row is one of those exercises that it really seems like it should be easy to learn. It should just make total sense because all you're doing is, you know, pulling the weight off the floor to your chest and bringing it back down. But to do it correctly, it requires a certain amount of tension so that you pull your hamstrings up with just a certain amount of tension so that when you are uh, at the bottom, your elbows are locked out. So that you lock out at the bottom and pull up to your chest and bring it back down. And it's not always as simple as that. It requires some certain learning mechanics for people to learn to do it, in particular to just stay explosive. And it's one of the things I'm trying to work with her on is that sometimes, especially like her final set, sometimes she will tend to lean over too far and have too much elbow bend in it. And the other thing is on the last rep, you'll notice she always turns loose and pulls her hands out of the way because she doesn't like the jarring when it hits the bottom. So she just skips the eccentric on the last rep and tries to turn loose up and get her hands out of the way so it doesn't bounce up and hit her hands. Um, that's fine to do if that's the way you want to do the pin lay, but you need to be aware if you're going to do a pin lay row that way, get your hands out of the way because that bar will bounce back up just like if you release on a deadlift on part of the way down, it will bounce back up and sometimes it will break your fingers or break a fingernail completely off. Uh, so you need to be aware of that that bar will bounce back up a few inches and if there's a lot of weight on it it's going to have a lot of kinetic energy and if it does it can injure you it can injure your hands it can injure your fingers so if you let go of the bar you need to make sure they are not within the bounce range when it comes back up uh, just a word of caution there again something people need to be aware of uh, you know what, and I also threw in a couple of my sets because I figured, what the hell, we were already filming a little bit. I didn't film everything I did. Um, just some deadlifting, and you know what, guys? You guys will notice I deadlifted one less rep uh, than I've done in some of the last uh, few workouts, and you know why? Because I undulate my intensity. I come in, I generally just work with five plates, uh, do moderate reps, and I have days to where if my hands are just hurting, or I feel stiff, I might stop at five reps like I did. I might even stop at four sometimes. I base it upon how I feel and how I'm recovering day to day. And you know, and there's other days to where I come in and do two or three more reps with the same amount of weight, leave one in the tank and I feel perfectly fine. And that's the thing, when you're doing high frequency deadlifting like her and I both do, um, we both deadlift three days a week, it's very important that you undulate your intensities. And the same thing, you don't need to be doing a lot of eccentric reps on a deadlift. You start doing large amounts of eccentric reps on a high toll exercise like the deadlift, uh, particularly trying to do slow eccentric reps, you will bury your recovery ability and you might find yourself fatiguing your lower back with so many micro tears that you can't function day to day. That is one of the keys to doing very high frequency deadlifting successfully is to keep those eccentric reps minimum or completely removed. Uh, if you're gonna be doing anything more than about two times to three times a week heavy, particularly if you go up to something like five, Eccentric reps are going to be your absolute enemy. They're going to hammer your recovery ability into the ground on the deadlift. Be aware of that. Uh, if you want to be able to deadlift at a high frequency to get really strong and explosive at it. Uh, so something to be aware of. Uh, I also did some pin lay rows again. You know, these are a little sloppier than last time. I added weight back on. Um, they're a little sloppier than I might like, but you know what? I can live with uh, pin lays that are a little sloppy every now and then as long as I go back 
and then reduce the weight sometimes and get them really, really strict. Um, and it's just the nature of the exercise sometimes. Sometimes you're more explosive at it with better form and you just have to assess that day to day. Again, pin leg rows is one of those exercises that I change uh, weights, I change rep ranges pretty often. Um, and sometimes I just find that I end up being a lot sloppier with a little more English on it. Is it the best way to do the exercise? Not always, probably not. Um, ideal form would be a little stricter than I'm doing uh, in the video today. But you know what, I've also filmed me doing them extremely strict as well. Uh, again, just one of those things that you have to just assess day to day. Uh, like I said, a little sloppier than I would recommend people doing a little sloppier than I was personally happy with. And it just happens that way sometimes. There are times when you're doing them and they feel fairly strict. But then when you watch the video or you have someone else watch it, they look at it and say, hey, uh, you know, that wasn't as strict or as clean as you thought it was. And you know what? You can't let those things hurt your ego. You just have to accept those things and say, okay, next time I'll come in and I'll take a little bit of weight off so that I can tighten that form up. And you, you own it and you live with it. And, but that's the other thing. That's one reason it's very important for you to have competent people assessing your technique, assessing your form, or videoing yourself. You don't want to be watching yourself in the mirror ever when you lift. I think mirrors and gyms are one of the worst inventions ever. Um, some of the people will say, well, you've got the mirror in front of you when you're deadlifting. Yeah, but I have my glasses off. Uh, so it doesn't really count. It's like, I'm kind of blurry. I can't really completely see everything clearly uh, to the extent that a lot of people would who are staring. And I block it out anyways. I try not to even notice uh, as it is. I block out everything around me during a lift. Uh, it's a good habit to have. But yeah, it comes down to the fact that looking at yourself in the mirror is not the way to do it. You need to video yourself or you need to have other people watch if you really want to work on your form and technique. Um, it's a very, very valuable tool. And videoing your list for your own assessment. Uh, again, since video cameras are so prolific today, back when I trained years ago, they weren't. No one had video cameras. No one had portable video cameras when I was younger in training. Uh, like I, everyone who had a video camera was like a big camcorder, you know? Thing this big you carried around with a VHS tape in it. <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad when I was a young man. You know, it was back in the late 90s or, you know, turn of the millennium there. But it was pretty bad. But we, everyone has cameras on their phones. They have camcorders. Everyone has a way to record now. It's an amazingly useful piece of technology. Use it in your training. It is one of the single most valuable tools that we have today for our own form and technique. You add, use it to your advantage. Um, it's extremely valuable tool. There's no excuse for you to not have some videos of your form for you, you to be able to look at and make sure that you're doing things wrong, right or wrong and what you can correct. Because you know what? Any of us, no matter where we're at in our training, we can always find little things that we can improve on here and there on our technique and form. All of us, every single one of us. And that I've even heard world champion level lifters even say that about themselves. That they've gone and looked at videos and said, man, I could really make some changes in my technique and I could get better. And if world champions can, can do that, then every single one of us can. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.